CataractCoach.com, podcast number six with David F. Chang. You know Dr. Chang from all his work on the cataract world. From the challenging cataract cases, all the major meetings, putting on those great symposia where he asked, you make the call, what do you do next? From his work in describing things in cataract surgery that have changed the way we operate, such as antibiotic prophylaxis and ophthalmitis risk. Things that looking at floppy iris, tamsulosin, IFIS, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Again, from him. How he teaches the world FACO CHOP. And he's been doing that for many years. If you're not learning CHOP, you're already behind, so get on it. But we had a fantastic conversation, and I learned so many more things. Things that I just didn't realize about Dr. Chang, and some of his passions that may actually surprise you. So I think you'll enjoy this podcast. Check it out. So welcome to our Cataract Coach podcast. Now we're talking with David Chang. You know him from CHOP, Learning FACO CHOP. You know him from Charity and, and the humanitarian missions around the world. And you also know him, he's most famous for me, for challenging cataract cases. So I, that, those are kind of my three things, but there's a lot more to Dr. Chang than meets the eye. So welcome, Dr. Chang, and tell us, how did you get into ophthalmology? How'd you get interested? Well, this is uh, great to be here uh, as your guest, uh, Yude. You know, um, my father, like yours, uh, was a physician. He was an anesthesiologist. So growing up, I kind of met all these surgeons, and I knew, you know, kind of in high school that I wanted to be a general surgeon. So when I finally got to med school, it's like the first elective I signed up for was general surgery. It was the Peter Ben Brigham. And I got sure. placed, you know, with uh, the uh, the resident service. And boy, people were so depressed and uh, <laughs> run down. And it was just uh, after all of my uh, efforts to get into med school and to do everything I could to be a surgeon, what a, a shock that I realized this is not for me. So then I was like, you know, uh, having to scramble to figure out uh, what to do. And I remember, uh, you know, I'd just been on for like five nights on call in a seven day span, and that's what you did to get a day off. And I just needed to do laundry on Saturday morning. <laughs> and uh, my chief resident, who was a real bear, said, no, you can't go home. We have grand rounds. And I said, really? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm sleep deprived. They go to general surgery, grand rounds, Saturday morning, the Peter Bent Brigham. And they take turns. And it was the ophthalmologist's subspecialty day. So they kind of presented what's new. And this is 1978. They showed a 35 millimeter film of a guy named Charlie Kelman doing a new method of cataract surgery. And that was the first time I saw FACO. Wow. And, and this light bulb went off. And I said, now that really looks interesting. Well, I kind of had to scramble and figure out a little bit about ophthalmology. I went to the Mass Ioneer and kind of, you know, we did our med student rotation there. And, uh, you know, they, they want you to do a little talk to your fellow students. Everybody does, how do you do direct ophthalmoscopy or diabetic retinopathy. And I went to the library and checked out this book that told all about how Kelman did FACO with a Christmas tree capsulotomy. And I gave this, <laughs> and I borrowed this film and showed it to my classmates who had zero interest uh, in that at all. So, uh, you know, I arranged to go into surgery with my preceptor at Mass Ioneer. He said, come on in, I'm operating on Saturday. So I went there and he and his assistant were doing an intracap with loops. And I said, wait a minute, where's the FACO machine? Where's the microscope? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so I ended up doing, uh, you know, UCSF's uh, residency. And, you know, I, I kept wanting to do FACO. So, you know, we started in, uh, this is probably 1982. And I'm a resident in my second year. Uh, I started doing intracaps that year. Then we did extra caps with PC lenses and felt pretty comfortable. And then at the end of my second year at the VA hospital, I started to do uh, FACO. And I remember I was comfortable with extra caps, but I broke capsule on my second, fourth, and seventh FACOs. Wow. Uh, and it was a disaster. And again, I had this uh, disappointment of this isn't so so easy after all. And my uh, senior resident, who was, his name is Carl Minatoy, he practices in Hawaii, kind of pulled me aside and said, you know, 
I had the same thing happen to me. And it wasn't until I did like my 12th case that I started to feel comfortable. And you, you're old enough to know in 1982, there was no strategy. We would just sculpt and sculpt sure. until Bowl it you, out. Hit, you, held the, you, you hit the posterior capsule at some point. So I kept up with it. And uh, the, the, the breakthrough was Tom Mazzocco, uh, who learned from Dick Kratz, uh, basically had a video recorder attached to his microscope. And, um, you know, he, we, would, we were allowed to go down there and, and visit. So one of the senior residents, you know, I was still a second year, brought back this VHS video and with no sound, no narration. It was not edited, but we saw the Kratz technique, which involved using your second hand. And that made such a difference because you could tip the nucleus up, sure. do the FACO. And so from case seven on... I finished my residency with 69 FACOs and fortunately didn't have any drop nuclear wow. complications after that. So I probably finished in 1984 with the highest resident volume of FACO. And uh, it, was, it was all thanks to Tom Mazzocco's videos and Carl Minatoya's uh, not allowing me to quit. Um, See, so we, so we, we all learned by video still. Yeah, yeah, this, is, this was really back then. And, uh, uh, you know, so... What kind of became, uh, you know, my obsession with FACO, it's kind of interesting that here I am, you know, in uh, 2023, and what have I done with my whole career is focused on FACO. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's been, I've been blessed uh, to have that. The other little anecdote is, you know, I started in private practice, and my first academy, I, you know, of course, I went to Charlie Kilman's instruction course, and I'm in this room full of people. And, you know, it's like, there he is, really live and in person as Charlie Kilman. So that was such a thrill. So my, my actually, one of my first ASRS meetings uh, is 2000. And I'm giving a paper. And uh, the, the paper is uh, basically, um, you know, on shallow chambers and they put me on the panel and you know then they always have a famous person as the moderator was charlie kelman and so i'm sitting next to him and jack Doddick is and uh, bruce wallace and myself and nobody knows who i am and jack Doddick, you know we're, we're listening to this free paper session and you know making some comments and jack Doddick goes you know what are you doing right after this course uh not much I didn't have anything sure. to do. He says, how would you like to take my place? Um, I, I'm double booked in two courses. And uh, would you like to take my place in Charlie Kelman's course? And I, I said, yeah, sh- okay. What a when dream. Is it? When is it? He says, it's like right after this session. <laughs> so we don't have laptops back then. We have VHS tapes. Sure. But I happen to have a tape. I think I was giving a booth talk. And in it, I had like some of the first cases uh, using Tripan Blue. So I go to the, the Kelman's course right after this. I had to find the VHS recorder to rewind the tape. And I go in there and the room is packed, you know, and it's Howard Fine and, and uh, sure. you know, all, all these famous people. And then Charlie goes, uh, our next uh, is D- David Chang. You know, he has no idea who I am. So I get up there and I say, I'm presenting in Charlie Kilman's course. So I show my videos. It's got tri- Tripan Blue. Most people hadn't seen that. And afterwards, he said, that was really good, you know. And by golly, he invited me to be in the faculty uh, on, on every one of his courses at ASCRS or AEO after that. So, so that's just the happenstance. Wow, of, that's uh, awesome. Getting to, meet, getting to meet Charlie Kilman. Uh, and uh, I still am good friends uh, with his wife, who's been on the board of the SRS Foundation. And when I did my very first textbook on FACO CHOP, um, Charlie uh, wrote the foreword for it. And it was probably one of the last things he wrote because he was already, um, unfortunately, terminally ill. Wow, what a, what a special yeah. story there. Yeah. Uh, it, it also important to mention, our viewers on counter coach t- tend to skew uh, younger, 30s yeah. and 40s. This is not the FACO machine you have today. We have to kind of explain a little bit. 
Oh my God. Well, you know, what we had was um, the vacuum never went higher than about 80. And there was no uh, foot pedal control of FACO. It was on or off. So you went from zero to 100% FACO power. Wow. So you couldn't, you know, it was just flooring it uh, from the start. So it was rough. You know, we did can opener capsulotomy. So every capsulotomy had a tear in it. It had multiple tears. Uh, when I was a resident, we actually weren't allowed. We didn't have viscoelastic. So wow. we did every. We put the lenses in under air. I'm dating myself, and uh, it was it, it. You know, it it um, it kind of required a little bit of um, a, an adventuresome spirit, and it required an attending. Uh, and I was lucky to have. I didn't have you teaching me, but I had a fellow named John Stanley, who was chief of RVA. And John, I don't know actually if he was just fearless or he was just curious because he wasn't <laughs> doing FACO, but he would let us as residents do FACO uh, at the VA. And again, uh, uh, despite the, the rocky start, we got really good results uh, at the end. So, and uh, I actually just did John's cataract. <laughs> you wow, know, what a yeah, great story. Yeah, yeah he's, he's almost 90 years old and we still keep in touch. So I owe I owe everything to his willingness to let me do FACO in 1982. Yeah, I mean it's a good point. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, totally, totally. But I think uh, you know I I think you must feel this way too. Um, every time you know we get kind of a little burnt out or a little overworked, uh, you just got to remind yourself. You know we are so blessed to be doing cataract surgery. Yeah. Right? I mean, sure. we're every single person we take a cataract that we're actually curing them. The, the the number one cause of global blindness is cataract, and we get to now be refractive surgeons at the same time. And I guess that's why it's still not boring. You, just being uh, just doing nothing but right thousands of cases since. later. Thousands of cases later, I still love it. And I think yep. the amazing part is you change the way someone sees the world every waking moment for the rest of their life. That's magic. That's right. Yeah. No. And then everything that you're doing that, you know, when you're teaching residents, when you're with your cataract coach, uh, you know, the impact, this ripple effect is, you know, every one of those people is just going to, again, take care of so many people because it's our high vol highest volume procedure. So it really is a privilege and, and such great fortune, right, to, to, to be in this situation and uh, I literally don't know if I would have been an ophthalmologist if I had done my laundry that Saturday morning. See, that's how fun, funny how life works out sometimes. Yeah, uh, totally, totally. But I mean, it was, I found it so interesting is as a medical student, you just happened to see one of the very first videos of FACO, and then you became like FACO, FACO, FACO. Not ophthalmology, FACO. No, yeah, exactly. Uh, it was actually one of the reasons that I uh, chose private practice, actually. You know, I, I did my residency at UCSF. Sure. And uh, it was, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, I got a, a, a lot of encouragement to join the faculty there. Sure. And I did like the idea of, of course, teaching and uh, teaching surgery. And, of course, you know, my faculties were all the people that I was admiring and was hoping I would not let down and try to, you know, I was trying to impress them as a resident. And here they want me to join them in the faculty. Um, but it was a tough decision because I kind of realized that, you know, the residents do all the surgery. At least they sure. do at UCSF. It's probably like with you at UCLA. And I would just be attending, but I wouldn't be operating. Yeah. And again, you go through this whole, um, you know, odyssey to be able to do surgery. And, and that sort of, um, you know, that, that would have been disappointing. So I didn't do a fellowship because I wasn't really interested in cornea or glaucoma. I was interested in, in doing FACO. FACO. There was no FACO fellowship in 1984 when I finished my residency. So I, I made a really d difficult decision to go into private practice. It kind of uh, an opportunity came up uh, late in my senior year. And of course, I just felt I was really, uh, you know, letting my program my program chair the faculty down i felt like you know i was kind of the black sheep i didn't do a fellowship i didn't go into academics uh but um two things i wanted to actually operate myself and not have others do the surgery sure. and the second 
was, you know, I didn't really have any research interest. I didn't, like, I had, didn't know the first thing about writing a paper. You just wanted and, a surgery. Yeah, and, and also I didn't <laughs> want to, like, why would I want to, like, write papers and, you sure. know, do any of this when I just wanted to operate? So so I went into private practice, and, you know, the, the problem is, you know, we're in Silicon Valley. Uh, this was the oldest practice still is the oldest practice continuous in Silicon Valley. And uh, when I started, you know, there were like uh, 15 other people uh, in our hospital doing cataract surgery. I was the one no one had ever heard of. Uh, we didn't have a FACO machine. It was oh, wow. all man- manual extra cap. So I did general ophthalmology and did a lot of refractions. I maybe did 12 cataract operations my first year. They were all extra caps because we didn't have a FACO machine. So I pretty much started at the bottom rung. and wow. uh, climbed all know, the way was, to the top. No, yeah. was just, I was just hoping I could make a living and not, you know, have to uh, move away from here. Wow, what, a, what an amazing whole pathway you've taken. Well, so I, I actually <laughs> solved the issue of academic versus private practice by doing both. I always did a hybrid. I had my own private practice and then part-time academics. And actually... Just last year, I actually retired from teaching residents. I did, I did yeah. 22, 22 years, which I think is enough, and now time to kind of pass the baton yeah. to the next generation. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because we didn't talk about it back then that way. You know, it, it was very different in the 80s. Um, all of the most famous people were uh, academic chairs. Sure. And, um, you know, there were some famous cataract surgeons, but cataract wasn't really something that was talked about that much in, in academia. And, uh, you know, the real kind of um, key opinion leaders were all in academics. Uh, so like you, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to make a living in private practice, but I had so much time. So uh, my mentor, John Stanley, I said, you know, can I, would you like me to help teach at the VA? And even though, you know, it's about an hour drive, uh, I would go up there a couple times a month and do the, you know, the Friday surgery day sure. uh, with the residents. I did that for 25 years. Wow, that's awesome. And would take a day off, you know. Uh, and uh, that was great because that's, it's like, this is what I would have been doing if I was a full-time faculty member. But as you know, um, you have to kind of get to another level to guide someone else through surgery sure. complications. You have to figure out what they're having trouble with. And it might be something that for you is so obvious and easy, but they're struggling with. You have to figure out for them uh, you know, what it takes to get them over the hump and um, I certainly think uh, that probably uh, improved my skills as a surgeon uh, more than just doing uh, surgery itself. Yeah, teaching surgery can oftentimes be a lot tougher than doing the surgery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so you know, I, I was on a conference call recently, and they were talking about anterior vitrectomy, and I said, about how many anterior vitrectomies have you done with residents? I said, well, maybe one a week, so 50 a year. For the past twenty, about a thousand. Wow! And they're wow. saying, "Wow, you've got a hell of an experience." But yeah, yeah, because you do so many resident cases. Yeah, yeah. That, well, you know, I think a great analogy is like learning to play golf. You know, sure. because okay, you can't just do it from a book or watching videos. You got to get in and, there. And the simulator is great, but if no one's watching you in the simulator, all you're doing is repeating the same slice yeah. over and over and yeah. over and over again. So that attending that sits with you, uh, you know, who like a like a golf pro has to figure out why I have a slice or sometimes sure. I have a hook, and you know uh, they have to relate because they don't have that problem, but they have to figure out sure. why I have it, you know. So that's what we do when we teach uh, surgery. And you also obviously teach on a bigger stage, right, with the AAO and other big big um, regional national meetings. You do a lot of teaching. Well, you know, I love it, but uh, I, I never planned it that way. As I said, I, I pretty much thought I made this fork in the road decision to go into practice, and that's okay. You know, I, you know, achieved a lot in med school residency. No one would ever know who I am. That's okay because uh, I just wanted to take care of patients. 
And I, um, I, I, I never really did much except go to the AO meeting as an attendee. And, you know, the instruction courses were expensive then. So I had to be very careful about which ones I'd go to. And uh, so 1997, I've been in practice for 13 years and I get a call from uh, our former, well, our pathologist at UCSF is a guy named Brooks Crawford. He was also in private practice, did all the pathology at UCSF. Uh, and uh, Brooks had a, a stellar career, uh, you know, in academics and did a lot of speaking. And for the academy, he was in charge of what was called the annual meeting program committee that chose all of the papers and the posters. Mm-hmm. And um, he called and, you know, and you know, asked me to uh, be the cataract person on that. They had one cataract, one cornea, one retina. Basically, it was seven people and a chair that chose all the papers and the posters. And I have to say, back in those days, a paper at the Academy was even a little bit bigger than it is now, sure. right? And I said, I can't possibly do that, Brooks. I mean... I don't, nobody, I've never done anything in cataract surgery. I've never spoken on it. And nobody knows who I am. I don't have any expertise because there's just one person. I said, no, 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 you'll be great. You'll be great at it. You'll be great at it. Well, I think, you know, don't, you'll be great at it. You're perfect. So he puts me on this committee. And again, uh, you know, there's seven of us and we go through every single abstract. It actually took, um, you know, an entire three-day weekend to go through that. And I spent the whole first, you know, two years with the imposter syndrome, right? I just sure, sort of sure. didn't want to, you know, <laughs> let on too much. that, And everyone is looking at me, who is this guy? Um, but I, I, I learned, and I learned uh, a lot about uh, listening to everybody discuss these abstracts about why this study was good and why you needed a control and why this abstract was good. And um, so I kind of learned a lot by doing that while I was, again, just trying not to look stupid. And um, I also uh, saw, you know, how all the courses were chosen and how people would write courses and they talk about it. And of course, one of the most important things was, you know, this is something new. So I started in 1997 on this. And in 1998, I said, you know what? I've been doing FACO CHOP. I, you know, I learned how to do CHOP. Uh, Nagahara. There were, no cor- there were no courses back then, but there was that video that Nagahara did with the Great. white cataract. And I said, maybe I should try to do a, a CHOP course. And the, again, the problem is, you know, my name, you know, it's like John Smith. Nobody knows who this is. So I just felt I needed to uh, have another name on there. And I had met Randy Olson at a course that uh, I think Allergan did at the time to help people transition to FACO. And uh, I knew he liked to do FACO chop. So I kind of wrote a letter to him. Uh, Gee whiz, you know, Mr. Dr. Chairman Olson, what would you think if uh, we had a course you know, and would you possibly be willing to be my co-faculty? And uh, bless Randy, uh, he said, sure, I'd love to do it. Wow. So then we we applied, we got approved, we gave the first course in 1998. And of course, we've given the course at every academy and ASCRS still will do it twice this year as well. And so that's kind of how I got my actually first, probably my first podium at a meeting was actually that instruction course. Wow. Now, I'm a big FACO CHOP fan as well. So I also, I took the initiative to learn it during residency. At yeah. the time, none of, none of our UCLA faculty, when I was a resident, did CHOP at all. And so I had to learn kind of by watching Osher's videos of yeah. other surgeons. And we, we, I learned that slowly but surely. But how come now, to almost 30 years after Nagahara's original video, why don't we have a better uptake of FACO CHOP? Yeah, that's a really good question because, uh, uh, you know, I've been teaching this course, as I said, since 1997, and we tried a lot of different things. Uh, we actually, I had zero interest in writing a textbook or a textbook chapter, 
but we got so many, uh, we, we got great feedback from the course and, uh, you know, people kept asking, is there a textbook? So we eventually wrote a textbook in the late 90s and I used the course faculty. Uh, so that helps. Uh, we, we were the first course at AEO to bring in 3D video, you know, sure. uh, because I, I got to try True Vision way back when. So I made all these 3D videos of uh, chopping uh, and I thought that would help. And I think that, um, you know, it still, I think, very much depends on what you're taught in your residency. And uh, because once you kind of reach that point, you have that comfort level, you know, as we know, it does require uh, really use of the non-dominant hand sure. quite a lot. Of course. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tough for when you feel totally comfortable, you're getting great results with divide and conquer. You kind of wonder, well, why do I really need to learn something new sure. and be uncomfortable with it for a while? But as you and I know, it's not about being faster or more efficient. It's is really how you can handle the toughest cases, yeah. you know, whether it's be rock hard or small pupils or zonulopathy, uh, because it just makes those tougher cases so much more right. doable. Sure. And, you know, but I, I you know, it, it's a, it's a good question. And I, I wish we had uh, more success at uh, converting people uh, to that. Right. I always say, once you learn FACO chop, I will guarantee it that you will not revert back to older techniques on a routine basis. You will yeah. choose this as your primary gun. Yep, nobody goes back, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. I also want to talk about you when you do the uh, You Make the Call video sessions at the Academy meetings. People in the audience may not realize, like I've been on your panel many times, the, yes, pan the panelists are never given the case ahead of time. You surprise us all. Yeah, no, those are fun. I mean, I, I started the uh, Cataract Spotlight, uh, let's see, it's about 22 years ago. Wow. And, um, it, you know, and that, again, is because I was um, on the program committee for the Academy. So as it got reorganized and grew, I became, you know, the, I became chair of the Cataract, what became the Ch Cataract Program Committee. And uh, subspecialty days were just coming out at the academy, and they were a huge success, a whole day of retina, a whole day of cornea. And so I went to, at the time, Dunbar Hoskins, again, as a program committee member, and said, you know, can we have a cataract subspecialty day? Because I think that people would love to, like, see all these famous people speaking all day long in cataract. Said, That's, sure. Yeah, he hated the idea because it's not a subspecialty. <laughs> <laughs> and if we put everything on Friday and Thursday, no one would come for the uh, rest of the meeting. So after some persistence, he finally said, look, I'll let you do something. Um, we'll do something, but two conditions. We don't, you know, it can't be subspecialty. One, it has to be in the middle of the meeting. So he made it on Monday. Okay. And two, I want you to organize it. I don't want, and I said, oh, wow. Uh, okay. So um, that was one of my first times organizing anything. And again, I had to invite all these well-known people that I didn't really know. Uh, there was no track record. And I, you know, I p figured I'd ask for four hours and then maybe I'd get one. And he said, fine, take the whole morning and four hours. So that's why it wow. always started as a four-hour symposium. So after we had a couple of them, I just was trying to you know, come up with a different uh, format. Yeah. And uh, this was back when uh, Mark Packer was my uh, co-chair. And I said, what if we mix a case, but also have some lectures, and then we have panel. And this is when we just had this audience response uh, poll system sure. come out. So at the time, it was really expensive, right? Because you had to rent these the little paddles, right? Yeah. And it was very expensive, but the this had become pretty popular, so the Academy said, we'll try it once. And then I, you know, the idea was you'd stop the case and, and ask questions and then ask the faculty. And so, uh, but what was different is um, the entire four hours, we would show four, uh, maybe seven cases. So I would yeah. pick seven cases that have multiple teaching points. They wouldn't be too redundant. And we just talk about these seven cases. So again, I wasn't sure how that would go over. Let's try it one year. 
and you know we still do it and, and alternate it but it it is a nice way to teach because if you're uh, just passively sitting in the audience and you don't really have to make any decisions sure and you're just watching um, you don't really kind of learn as much as when you pause and you literally have to think about what you're gonna do and then you put down what you, you know you vote and then you see what these uh, faculty do. And, uh, you know, I think naturally people like seeing this sort of unscripted discussion. Right. And they kind of like seeing the faculty unsure about what to do. Right. Uh, and I think it's uh, just, a, just a nice way to learn because, as you and I know, uh, we learn the most from when we encounter a tough case. Of and course. we really had to go through it. And, you know, it's painful like falling off your bike, but ever since that case, whenever something like that comes up again, you had to master it and not just get through the case. You thought about it. You asked people. You mm-hmm. researched sure. what would have been a better way to do it. So that's uh, just like in internal medicine. You get a case that stumps you, and then you really have to, you know, then reading about all the syndromes that it could be, uh, it's a lot more interesting and practical and relevant when you're doing it when it relates to a case versus just going systematically through a textbook. Yeah, I think one of the beauties of that session that you put on is that everyone in the audience is acting as if they are literally operating. They're looking at, your, at the video, you're doing this case, and you present it as such. You'll say, okay, you're doing this case, and now all of a sudden you see this chamber deepening. Pause the video. Okay, what do you want to do? Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, that's kind of how I learn the best. And, uh, you know, as as you know from all your video editing, it's a lot of work to yeah. edit it. And it's a lot of work to kind of, you know, select those cases. Uh, but at the end, it's fun. And it's, uh, it's a little bit like, I don't know, a show. It's kind of fun to see the audience react. Yeah, uh, the, interact- like, the interactive like part is great. Yeah, interactive yeah. part is great. And, and yeah, I think the, the most important, too, is there's just great take-home points that you yeah. remember later. So as you yeah. say, when then people in the audience see that at some point in the next year or two in their own clinic, in their own operating room, ah, yeah. they remember, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so I, I kind of, uh, you know, when I go internationally, I kind of, you know, uh, do that same type of thing. Uh, I, Rudy Knights uh, participated it, uh, in it uh, one year, and then ever since then, he and I do that same symposium for about 90 minutes at ESCRS. And uh, so I'm glad it's been popular, and uh, you know, I'm glad it's helped people. Yeah, speaking of ESCRS, you were very rare. You were the, only the second American ever to present that keynote lecture at the ESCRS. Tell us about that. Oh, well, that was very nice. I mean, they... Uh, uh, the SRS meeting is, of course, uh, you know, it's now uh, just as big as ASCRS, and uh, that certainly, you know, was an honor. Uh, Doug Koch is the other American uh, that's uh, done that. And um, I actually uh, I gave the lecture, it was a chance to talk about Erevin uh, and sort of introduce the European audience to all of the lessons that we can uh, learn from Erevin, which is, you know, again, one of my favorite places and uh, sure. uh, a lot of good friends and close friends at Erevin. Yeah, you had that, that's that very important paper about two million cases and intracameral moxie. Tell us more about that. Yeah, uh, you know, I had really, I probably didn't do very well in microbiology in medical <laughs> school. It wasn't really something that uh, was really of that much interest to me, kind of like optics in my eye residency. Um, but what uh, we're talking about case experience. What got me interested in uh, antibiotics was actually uh, my own cluster of endophthalmitis. Uh, you oh, know, yikes. I, I, my very first endophthalmitis. Uh, I never had one as a resident. My very first one in practice came. I don't know. I was in practice maybe six years, and my chairman Steve Kramer. Uh, at UCSF, and I'm in private practice now in the Bay Area, he sent his mother to me. And it's like, I was really honored, but I was a little nervous because, you know, this was one of the first real VIPs I had done. So I I did her case. It went really well. I was feeling great. And, uh, but then she called up 
uh, I think a couple nights later in the middle of the night, and I went in and saw her, and she had endophthalmitis. Oh, so that was my very first case was my chairman's mother. Oh, my and, goodness. Oh, my God. It, it, like the uh, humiliation to know that every faculty, everybody at UCSF was talking about, you know, Mrs. Kramer send out the Midas and she saw the retina people up there and everybody saw her. Well, fortunately, it was a gram positive. She did well. She regained all her vision, but um, it really shook me. So I was fine until... Uh, and I, I looked this up uh, about 1998 now. So I've been in practice for 14 years. I think I had had that one case. And I had, during a summer, uh, such a rough summer, I had a case of endophthalmitis, gram positive. You know, it's one of these, you do great surgery, you see them post-op day one, they're fine. Sure. And you get a call five days later. And because I was operating on Tuesdays, I'd get a call on the weekend. Uh, all of a sudden, my vision's cloudy. And I went in, and there was stuff in the vitreous, and it's endophthalmitis. Oh, boy. So, oh, my God, it was it was awful. And uh, I felt so bad. Okay, what happens? So the patient actually did okay. So I go for another month. Maybe I do 100 cases back then. So uh, this is 1998. And I get another call on a weekend. Oh, boy. And it's a patient I've seen on Tuesday. Post-op day one was fine. And now on Sunday, they can't see. And there's all these cells in the vitreous. Now, I've got two of them. And I'm going, what am I doing wrong? I look at everything in and out, you know, reviewed everything I could. And... Um, both of the patients did fine because we diagnosed them early. The retina specialists, you know, treated them with intravitreal vanco and sure. uh, aminoglycoside. And okay, so we couldn't find, it looked okay. Well, um, another month passes. I do another, whatever, 100 cases, and I get a third case. Oh, my and goodness. And I, I was just beside myself. As, as This is supposed to happen one in a 1,000, one in 2,000. And I've had, they weren't a cluster like the same week or the same day from surgery. They were separate. Well, they all grew out gram positives. Two out of the three isolates were resistant to quinolones. And mm. back then we were probably using ciprofloxacin, you know, the old sure. siloxin. And I'm going, well, that's that's a problem because this broad-spectrum quinolone that I'm using, these bugs were resistant to it. And so, but they all cleared up. And what did they clear up with is a point, you know, point one of vancomycin. So I remember being really depressed. Um, and, you know, here you, you're doing such great surgery and you're having the worst complication there is for cataract surgery, and you don't know why. Sure. And uh, I, I, I was, I just remember how frightening that was. So now, like every time the phone would ring on a weekend, <laughs> you get anxiety. You're afraid to pick up the phone, uh, Doctor Chang. It's the answering service, Mrs. So and So. Can't see. Oh boy. Um, yeah. So, um, what do you do? Um, I didn't know him real well, but I had met Howard Gimbel. Sure. And I knew that he was injecting along with Jim Gill's intraocular antibiotics. I didn't know Jim Gill's. So I I don't know if we had email then, Ude, but I, I wrote a letter maybe and I said, Can you tell me what you're doing? And it was nice enough to I think we probably talked on the phone and he told me that he had been using intraocular vancomycin, hmm. you know, at Jim Gill's suggestion. And he told me that he had done 20,000 cases at that point and never had a single endophthalmitis. Wow. So I said, I got to do something, right? You feel you cannot go on unless right. you change something. So I changed to that. And um, I used intracameral vancomycin since 1998 up until 2016 when we published the paper on HORV. You know, and I, sure. I kind of led that, co-led that task force with the ASRS people, so I knew about that. So that 
um, that uh, that rehabilitated me as a cataract surgeon. It sure. gave me my confidence back. And it was kind of interesting because once you have this, if you share it, other people tell you they've seen that. You know, the retina people would tell you, yeah, these things come in cluster. Uh, you know, and, and we get these clusters in the summer. And uh, you remember Manus Craft, right? Manus sure. told, had a similar thing where one, one stretch, he was afraid to answer the phone because oh, he boy, had this wild. run. Yeah. And I said, I've been there. Um, so anyway, so uh, I ended up learning a lot about intracranial antibiotics. When I first went to Erevin in 2003, you know, I was there to teach FACO and speak at the opening of one of their new hospitals. And of course, I was just amazed at what they're doing there with, uh, you know, 60% of their patients get free surgery and this assembly line method with the manual small incision doing 16 cases an hour with one surgeon because they're going back and forth from, you know, one patient to another sitting side by side. And I kind of said, wow, this is just incredible. Uh, Now, they're reusing everything that we're not allowed to reuse in the United States because of the infection rate. Sure. And and I was asking about their infection rate. And, you know, I kind of gave them a couple of uh, thing, observations in 2003. Number one, I said, you know, you're bringing in all these people that are blind in one eye, and then you send them back. Why don't you think about, on some of them, doing both eyes? You know, Bilateral, same day. They, they're coming from so far away, and they're bilateral white cataracts. The second is they're using PMMA lenses, but they were doing orexis. So I said, you know, you ought to think about, you know, getting a square edge on your PMMA lens. Uh, And then the third thing I said is, you you know, you ought to think about intracameral vancomycin. I use it on every single case. It's well tolerated. It's safe. And uh, so we started this discussion and it took a long time. Uh, but they finally were noticing that their manual small incision, which has a larger incision, and that incision may leak a little bit, that their infection rate was a little higher. And so uh, we kind of devised a study. And they, um, you know, they can do so many neat things at Oralab, which is their company. They manufactured, they formulated their own moxifloxacin. Wow. And they felt that vancomycin, because the CDC says don't use it because you might have resistant bugs. So they went with moxifloxacin. Uh, and um, they saw this uh, immediate improvement because they're doing so much volume. So they started on the manual small incisions. And, you know, when you do, what is it, uh, 80,000 cases at one hospital in one year, half with and half without, you see that effect. Uh, so then we 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 expanded it. They expanded it, uh, and the you know they always involved me uh, in this because I had originally suggested it, and then we decided to write it up, and we, you know their records went back. Uh, basically, uh, we did this over about a uh, eight year period, and so we had a million consecutive without and a million consecutive with. That's amazing uh, and, numbers! And, wow. And, and what's so good about it is it's, yes, it's multiple surgeons, but at their 12 hospitals, as you know, they do everything the same. Everyone sure. uses the same viscoelastic, same lenses. You use the, because in order to be efficient, sure. Standardized. you have to use, yeah. So if every McDonald's has the same recipe for making a Big Mac because, you know, it's standardized and that's what makes it efficient. So the data is incredible, and that's really the best data, I believe, for showing this, because something as rare as endophthalmitis, well, as we've seen, uh, you know, getting a randomized controlled trial is so expensive, so difficult. Yeah. And the largest one at uh, ESCRS, you know, is only 16,000 patients. So oh, that's yeah. why, you know, Except a million Roxy. patients, a million patients with and without is, is, a, is a really, really important uh, database. So are you doing moxifloxacin now in your own patients? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we get it compounded uh, through yeah, the two largest 503B compounders in the U.S. are probably Impermis and Lighters, uh, and, and we use Lighters. That's, uh, that's been, um, you know, um, one of the challenges uh, that we have had with 
cataract surgery, I think in all of medicine is, is, um, you know, the regulatory situation. Sure. And, and it's unfortunate, right? Because, uh, almost every other surgical specialty, they use prophylactic antibiotics, often in the joint or in the yeah, abdomen sure. and yeah, so yeah, forth, sure. right? But we have to have something that is very carefully formulated because it's the intraocular, uh, what, what are the anterior chamber, and you get TAS if it's, you've got impurities and so forth. And yet... Um, the FDA, uh, you know, by law is supposed to have a randomized clinical trial. And yes, we understand the benefit of that, but that's impractical. And no one's right. been able to do it. No one, when they cal- do the calculation for the number of patients you need, uh, currently it's probably about 80,000 patients that you need to randomize. I mean, just think about how many centers you would need to do that, how expensive that right. is. That by the end of which, if you finally show that there's a benefit to recoup the cost of that, you're going to have to charge $200 for the drug. Sure. And then, because it's bundled, no one will be able to use it. Right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Stuck between a rock and a hard place with that. So that's, yeah. what we, that's why we do, th- like in our center, we do the same thing. We use compounded moxifloxacin as well. Yeah. So at Aravin, when they make it, it's a dollar one U.S. dollar for a vial of one ml. And, of course, they use it on multiple patients. So they're sure. treating maybe six or seven patients. So patients at Aravin are, for 15 cents of cost, are getting intraocular moxifloxacin that's formulated for the eye. And in so many other parts of the world, patients aren't getting it because, again, the surgeons are worried about whatever tasks and so forth. And so that's a sad irony that, uh, you know, American patients don't really have a, a commercially approved intraocular antibiotic. Yeah, speaking of the, the surgeries you saw there at Arabin, I want to talk about MSICS, so manual small incision cataract surgery. I used to teach the residents how to do it. I'm a big fan of it. And I, on occasion, even in our Beverly Hills Surgery Center, a couple times a year, I'd rather yeah. do MSICS than FACO. Tell me your experience yeah. with M- MSACS, and should this be brought to all American surgeons to learn too? Uh, I really believe it should. I mean, uh, again, I trained doing extra cap, and I know how great that was. My first year in practice, I didn't have a FACO machine. And uh, so extra caps, you know, I have a long uh, experience with that. But, of course, what they do at Irvin is so magical, you know, uh, to it, – it's basically how do you scale – an operation to cure blindness, you make it fast, easy to teach, and inexpensive. Sure. And assembly line. And that's what they do with this manual small incision. So I became a convert when I saw that. Why? Because I'm there, you know, this uh, well-known surgeon from America teaching FACO on these five-plus black lenses and taking forever and sweating up a storm and they polish off this manual in three minutes yes so it doesn't take a genius to see that this is how you solve global blindness um but you know you know the um uh there's a problem a lot of countries people want to adopt the Irvin system you know there's countries in south america for example where people will bring that in and who are the famous well-known, well-connected cataract surgeons. They're all advanced FACO surgeons yeah. in these, you know, low to middle income countries. And they, they'll they say, these people are not using the gold standard for surgery, which is FACO, Sure. you know, and th- they're, they're doing a terrible thing by doing these extra caps. And, and it's a, it's a, a, you know, it's basically an uninformed opinion. So I had an opportunity, um, you know, Sandik Ruit and Jeff Tabin, um, invited me to go to Nepal to do a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and their thought was, we'll take someone who's well-known in FACO, you know, and so I said, okay. And we would randomize these patients that came sort of from a cataract camp, and they'd either get Dr. Ruit doing manual small incision or me doing FACO. 
So, and we kind of did it not in a hospital, but we wanted to sim- they wanted to simulate kind of a, uh, an outreach. Okay. So they, they, we did this in a monastery about an hour and a half from Kathmandu. And I arranged at the time it was Allergan. They, you know, they gave us a FACO machine to bring. I used all their lenses. I used um, Viscout and we got a Zeiss microscope. And we carried this. They they had to porter it up to a you know two thousand three thousand foot high elevation where this monastery was, and they randomized these patients. We had a day and a half to do a uh, hundred some patients. Sure. So same thing. Okay, I'll go along with it. And I'm sitting there, and it was so difficult because all of these people either had a rock-hard brown lens with or without small pupils, but they all had panis, and they don't use drapes. So everybody (laughs) had, every eye was submerged in an oily tear film. And as I'm doing these cases, I'm just, I can just see the the paper, you know, David Chang, 20% 20 drop nucleus rate. And I'm going, uh-huh. you know, this is uh, this is not good. So um, I had one capsule rupture. I actually did a, a PAL technique to get the nucleus out, sure. cleaned it up. The eye did okay, but there was one problem. I spent about 45 minutes on that case, and I was so far behind schedule. Now we weren't sure I would be able to finish my arm of the study, which was 50 cases, in a day and a half. So anyway, that, that study was published and, um, you know, it, it's, it served a purpose, which is to say that for these really difficult cases, manual small incision was not only just as good, it was faster, it was less expensive. And although we say the complication rate was comparable, uh, you know, most of us doing these cases would have a much higher complication rate with, with uh, FACO. But it, that study has been helpful to defend people who want to advocate for manual small incision in developing world, you know, in a little middle income countries. Uh, just like you, I used it uh, in my own practice. Sure. Because, From you know, it's time. like, why hit your head on the wall when you can make a nice shelved incision, bring it out, put a, a you know, a monofocal in and a single suture These are not people that are asking to see without glasses because they're, you know, they're so, they're so blind. And it, it is a shame that uh, it's so hard for people to learn this in the United States. You know, it's kind of like, uh, not being able to use capsule retractors or Malugan rings or capsular dye and having to do it without the those way. other, yeah. the hard way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my most recent case where I did MSICS in Beverly Hills, no less. Yeah. An absolute dense rock of a, like a bowling ball. And the patient had a very weak thousand cells per square millimeter endothelial cell count. I was like, oh I'm God. not doing fake on that. Oh my God. Well, you were smart. And, and so, that's where it's so nice to have that, uh, really, really nice to have that uh, uh, ability. Yeah, we have a lot of videos actually on Cataract Coach about how to learn MSICS. So if, it, if you're listening to the podcast and you're interested, on cataractcoach.com, I've got a whole section of MSICS videos, including from expert surgeons from, from other parts of Asia, from Nepal, from India, who are unbelievably talented surgeons. Well, Cataract Coach is a treasure chest, Uday. I mean, it's so much time to put that together. Uh, uh, what, a, what a great contribution. And uh, it is really... It, it, it is like a coaching, you know. Yes, you're teaching, but we all need a little uh, coaching. Yeah. Can I just tell one more lesson from Aravind? Uh, oh, I'd love to hear. Oh, of course, yeah. as much time as you want. This is, this is probably, you know, one of the most important ones, okay? So we did this 2 million, you know, cases, right? And we showed, you know, here's with and without. Uh, we can get the uh, endophthalmitis rate down. But realize that at Aravind, because of the uh, expenses... They reuse gowns, gloves, um, sutures, irrigation solution, tubing, uh, FACO INA tips. Um, They use the same topical drop bottle 
and the same intraocular solutions on everyone. They have maybe six patients in the operating room. The patients just have a blanket over them. And so this is actually 2 million consecutive cases, registry study, everything standardized, all of these things reused. And if you or I did any of these, you're in trouble. A Medicare surveyor would shut us down because it's so obviously dangerous to patients to reuse these things, like reusing a gown. And so you can ask the question, well, what is the endophthalmitis rate when you do this 2 million times? It's 4 per 10,000. Now, remember, that's half of the people didn't have intracameral moxie. If you do intracameral moxie and you do FACO, your infection rate is 1 per 10,000. But the point is there's 2 million, 4 per 10,000. So what do we do in the United States? We throw everything out yes. because universal precautions say you can't reuse gowns or gloves. You've got to throw that irrigation bottle out. You can't have another patient in the OR. After we do our cataract, they have to wipe the counters. You know, they might Spray have to the clean solution, the floor. Close the know, room, put ra- the timer. Air, air it out because of cross-contamination, right? So yeah. what do we do? So, so of course, we're so safe in the U.S. We do all these things. So what is our, how much lower is our infection rate than air events? Well, you have to go to the IRIS registry. And they publish their infection rate and ophthalmitis rate for an overlapping period. They had 8.5 million cases. We know... It's in the United States, so we know you can't reuse your gowns, sure. your gloves, and, sure. and your irrigation solutions. What do you think the infection rate was? It was 4 per 10,000. It was the same. So that's more than 10 million big data studies. So something's wrong here, all right? And the, okay, so we're wasting a lot of money, but here's what I've come to learn. Um, you know, in terms of carbon emissions, um, the healthcare sector in the United States accounts for 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions from wow. our country. If the U.S. healthcare sector by itself was a country, it would rank number 13 in the world in terms of carbon emissions. Wow. And where is the bulk of that? We're the highest in the world. Uh, but in other countries like Canada, U.K., Germany, it's about 5%. It's still very high. Well, most of that is from the operating room and labor and delivery. And it's because of all the waste. And it's pharmaceutical waste, and it's all the other supply waste. So uh, if you calculate our carbon footprint for one FACO in the U.S., it's 20 times the carbon footprint of one FACO at Aravin. The cost obviously is way less. And what are we doing this for is to lower our infection rate but and yes, our the infection same. rate's the same. And that, you know, we don't know exactly how many had intracameral antibiotics in the IRIS registry, but we all know that uh, during the period that this was conducted, roughly half of the U.S. surgeons were not using intraocular antibiotics. So pretty comparable yeah. uh, to the era of a database. So um, uh, this is so outrageous that, um, you know, uh, we have a group that we started uh, a, a coalition with a website in an app. It's called iSustain, E-Y-E-S-U-S-T-I-I-N, iSustain.org. We launched it uh, at the ASCRS meeting. Uh, we now have three major societies that are co-sponsoring this as a big part of what the society does, the Academy, ASCRS, and ESCRS. Um, I chair the advisory board, and uh, we are basically trying to educate and look for ways to tackle some of this unnecessary waste. Because, you know, part of the problem is there's these universal precautions that I'm sure make sense for neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, but we're doing eye surgery, which is a sterile, you know, uh, we, we have a few drops, our, our body tissue is a few drops of aqueous, yeah. right? It's yeah. 0.2 mLs of aqueous that we flush out with viscoelastic and sterile irrigating solution. And it's a completely clean procedure for that reason. And so that Erevin study pretty much tells us that all of this single use 
It's a precaution. It's a perception that it would make sense. Not only is it unproven, the best proof you can generate is it doesn't make any difference. But it's not only costing a lot and it's causing supply chain shortages, but it's also um, you know, contributing to uh, carbon emissions from the healthcare sector. And why? Because we have the highest procedural volume uh, in all of medicine. So uh, isustain.org, that's sort of uh, the latest project. And, you know, it's not exactly something you can, you know, wrap your arms around. It's a huge topic, but uh, we've got industry involved. We now are asked, we've invited global eye societies to join and so we have global member societies popping up from all over the world. Uh, and I think we can bring more attention to this. But also, if ophthalmology, organized ophthalmology, particularly globally, can come up with policies that say, you know, you know this is our position paper. Our first one was, it's okay, it's safe to use a multi-dose bottle of drops perioperatively sure, on multiple patients. And you can use it until the uh, bottle expires. Uh, the, that, um, you know, the carbon footprint of a bottle of uh, medication is actually quite high because of the raw materials and the manufacturing process. So there's a ton of unnecessary waste. And, you know, uh, whether uh, you are concerned about climate change or whether you're concerned about, you know, bankrupting medical care, through you know unnecessary waste i don't know of anyone who favors unnecessary waste yeah i mean i look at our own surgery center where every case that i do generates a a large big trash bag full of all these disposable things yeah and then you have a you have a lineup of 20 30 cases you've got an entire truck full of trash from just those cases from cases that were five minutes long yeah. And you said clean, completely bloodless. <laughs> so it's it's just, no, it's, wild. It's, it's 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 ridiculous, right? And uh, we actually there were some actually pretty good studies during COVID because we were all concerned about wow, sure. you know, could could a COVID patient infect other subsequent patients or the staff? So there were a bunch of studies, you know, looking for can you aerosolize aqueous and using dye and so forth. What if a and, and all of them concluded that it's a, it's impossible to aerosolize virus that hypothetically was in the aqueous. Well, by the same token, that should apply to uh, you know uh, bacteria as well. Of course, of yeah. course, that makes a lot of sense. Now, everything you do has been. Fake, 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 cataract, cataract, cataract. <laughs> but you must like other things outside of just fake and cataract. What else do you like? What's important to you? What do you enjoy? Well, uh, I have to say, probably uh, I'm a big sports addict. Uh, my whole family is, and that's the one thing we enjoy. Uh, uh, I'm I'm sort of too out of shape and too old to to do a lot of the things I used to do, but. Boy, we uh, love spectator sports, and in the Bay Area, there's plenty to do. Sure. So we have season tickets, the Niners, the Warriors. I uh, used to share them for the Sharks, and then uh, we go to a lot of Giants games. And kind of that's uh, kind of my passion. And so, uh, you know, I need my whole family to collectively take turns going with me to the games. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, but it's a good way that uh, I can go with friends and so forth and, and catch up. Uh, and it, it's kind of not very time efficient, as you know, because if sure. you watch a game on TV, you can multitask. And I was kind of thinking of the, a good analogy. And it's kind of like, why do we go to live meetings? You know, uh, we learned from Zoom, wow, you can get, listen to lectures at your own convenience from your own, you know, desk chair and learn very effectively, uh, just like I can watch the game on TV and, and, you know, fast forward through the commercials. But uh, I think we all agree that going back to live meetings, yeah. It's a live experience. Yeah, It's a live experience. And it's kind of the same when you go to a football game and you got, you know, 70,000 people all going for the same reason and cheering for the same reason, it's a different experience that, than that watching energy. it by yourself. Yeah. yeah. And I think particularly in these times where 
with politics, uh, you know, we are so polarized culturally, politically, more than I can ever recall. Uh, you're just, what is our common ground? And, and, and go into to sports sometimes, and the fact that everyone around here roots for the same teams is kind of that common ground. That's awesome. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like fun. No, it's been great. Uh, there was, uh, I'll tell you this, between 2010 and 2020, that one decade, yeah. Uh, the four major Bay Area sports teams, we had 10 finals appearances, okay? So wow. that's three World Series, five NBA finals, two Super Bowls, and a Stanley Cup. And so, you know, I went to at least one of those, uh, you know, all 10, and it's it, that's been a, a remarkable ride. Uh, and anyway, so, so uh, that, uh, that's my guilty pleasure. Well, that's awesome. You know, earlier in the conversation we were talking about, you said, well, you, if you fall off the bike, you learn that lesson. So my, yeah. my hobby has been, I've been learning how to mountain bike, and I've fallen wow. off the bike. Wow. Oh, my God. I ran out of talent. I, I, my oh skill came my up short. God. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I, maybe, maybe 40 years ago, that would have made sense for me, but oh, my God, that's, that's I, I need to get that's better. scary. I, I need to get better pads. Oh, Absolutely. And maybe better skills. But anyway, what a pleasure to learn from you. I really enjoyed our conversation here. I want to encourage all our, our viewers and listeners, you can download the podcast directly now on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, wherever else you get podcasts. And I want to thank you again, Dr. Chang. A ton to learn from you. I look forward to your next panel. And please, surprise me and put me on the spot. Will do, Uday. Thanks very much. And and uh, kudos to you for the podcast, the Cataract Coach. Uh, you're the consummate teacher, and this is your creativity is, of course, a, a real gift to all of us. Thanks so much. All right. I trust that you enjoyed that podcast and learned a lot. What an incredible person. I've learned so much from Dr. Chang, and I look forward to continuing to learn from him. Our next podcast is coming up shortly. You can subscribe to these on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, or wherever you find your podcasts. And we're going to do one every other week until this summer, and then we're going to be at one a week. Check it out.